Welcome back, anatomy students. Now we're going to talk about the diencephalon, the brainstem, and the cerebellum. So grab your note sheet, grab your pencil, and let's get started. So um, this is a picture of the brain, and what I want you to recognize is where the diencephalon is, as well as the parts of the brainstem. The parts, the, so the diencephalon is highlighted in purple, and then the parts of the mid of the brainstem are the midbrain, which is light yellow, the pons, which is green, and then the medulla, which is pink. And so that's the diencephalon, and then the structures of the brainstem. Notice that I did not include the blue, the cerebellum. That is not technically a part of the brainstem. It's attached to it, but it's not a part of the brainstem. So, um, our diencephalon is going to include a couple of other structures. So, it's going to include the hypothalamus, the thalamus, and then something that's called the pineal gland. And so that is something that I would definitely add like to some of the white space that you've got on your page is that the diencephalon includes the hypothalamus, the thalamus, and the pineal gland. And there's a blow up picture of those structures. All right, now you've got a table for slides three through 11 that you're going to need to fill in. So the first part is a uh, part of the diencephalon, which is the thalamus. I'm just gonna move myself out of the way here. So the thalamus is, um, has a really interesting uh, structure. So when you see pictures like the one that you have here, uh, this is a mid-sagittal section of the brain. So it's cut right through the longitudinal fissure, through the corpus callosum, and then we're like looking at the inside of the brain. So this is like a mid-sagittal section. And the thalamus is that like lighter round part where the tip of the arrow is, and it's connected by that whiter part that's in the middle. So it's kind of like a yo-yo where you've got like the two sides, the peg in the middle where you wind the string around. But when you cut that in half, it looks like this. Um, the peg part of the yo-yo, or I should say the peg part of the thalamus is called the intermediate mass. And the thalamus is going to act as the relay station for sensory impulses to the cortex for interpretation. And our thalamus is going to give us some very crude recognition of some of the sensory information that's starting to come in um, to our brains. Um, we just know like whether it's pleasant or not, but we're, the thalamus isn't going to help us to identify it. Um, all sensory impulses, except for olfactory impulses, the sense of smell, are going to travel through the thalamus to our cerebral cortex. Oh, and that's everything that I just said, too. All right, the next part uh, that we're going to talk about is the hypothalamus. And so the prefix hypo means below. So the hypothalamus would be below the thalamus, and that's what we see in our picture here. All right, so uh, the hypothalamus um, has a lot of different nuclei, so different clusters of neurons that are going to um, synthesize and secrete different hormones. Um, and so we have the supraoptic nuclei, which is going to synthesize um, ADH or antidiuretic hormone. We have the paraventricular nuclei that are responsible for the synthesis of oxytocin. Um, we have letter C, the mammillary bodies. This is responsible for olfactory reflexes, like when we, you know, sensory information comes in and then um, we respond to that, like maybe we, you know, wrinkle our nose or make a face you know, if it's a perfume that we don't like. And then letter D is pointing to the infundibulum. This is a stalk that connects the pituitary gland to the hypothalamus, but it does play a really important role in the way that the pituitary gland works. So we're gonna talk about that um, in the spring. 
So the functions of the hypothalamus are many and varied. It's part of the limbic system, which is the emotional visceral uh, brain. It's responsible for um, our feelings of thirst, for our appetite, for um, sexual arousal. Uh, it's going to regulate our pain and pleasure centers as well. And like I mentioned, it's going to produce a lot of different hormones. So because it's made of nervous tissue, it's kind of the link between the nervous and the endocrine system. And it's going to be in charge of the pituitary gland. The last part of our diencephalon is the epithalamus. And so um, this is going to include the pineal gland and the choroid plexus of the third ventricle. And so if you look at the picture, you have like some stripes, like red kind of drawing there that's supposed to be um the choroid plexus so the um the third ventricle is going to bathe the inside of that yo-yo like around that um around the intermediate mass and the roof of it contains capillaries that are going to secrete cerebral spinal fluid with the help of our ependymal cells now the choroid plexus isn't only in the third ventricle, it's also in all of the other ventricles or spaces of the brain too. But I really wanted to also talk about the pineal gland. Um, the pineal gland is going to regulate our sleep-wake cycle by secreting melatonin. The more melatonin we have, the more we're going to sleep because the absence of light is going to stimulate the release of melatonin. Um, sunlight is going to suppress it. And this is just a little graph that I found that I thought was interesting. Just kind of showing you in general. <laughs> Excuse me, I had to yawn. So I turned <laughs> So I tried to pause it. I'm talking about melanoin and, and how like the peak of it is like at, I don't know, like three o'clock or so, but oh my gosh, it's uh, 11 o'clock right now. <laughs> and I'm already like yawning at you. I apologize. All right. Um, so I'm going to pause and skip through all the, and now let's talk about the brainstem. So the, the brainstem it consists of the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. Where's my arrow? There it is. Okay. Okay. And so here in this, um, picture, what you're looking at are different pathways that um, our brainstem is going to be involved in. So it's largely a relay for information going, for sensory information going up to the cortex. That's what the blue arrows are doing. And then for information that are coming back down through the cortex. And the thing that I think is really interesting here um, that I'm going to bring up a little bit later is the fact that you have sensory information that kind of flip around and enter into the cerebellum and then it comes out of the cerebellum and then it travels to the RAS, the uh, reticular activating system, which is our filter for what's important getting up to our cortex. And then it also goes up to the thalamus and then up to the cortex as well. And then notice that the red arrows are coming back down with uh, motor information from the cortex back through the thalamus and the brain and the midbrain and the pons. And some of it is even going to go back out to the cerebellum. And then it moves on down um, the tracks of the spinal cord. So you've got information flowing in two directions all the time. Okay, so this picture is of the midbrain with the cerebrum completely removed and the cerebellum removed as well. So we're just like looking at the stock of the brain itself. Um, it's largely, it's largely made up of, of white matter. Like I said, like the reticular activating system that's in charge of our consciousness is made of like a diffuse cluster of, um, gray matter, but in, but for the most part, our midbrain is white matter. And we have a couple of structures that you need to know. The first are the cerebral peduncles. 
Yes, the cerebral peduncles. And the cerebral peduncles, you can see that they are labeled here on the right-hand side of your screen by the midbrain. Um, these are responsible for um, some motor, uh, sending uh, motor um, signals out to the to the body. Um, and I just remember that because I'm mean, peduncle, first of all, that's just a funny word, but ped, like a pedal, like a bicycle pedal, and you got to move in order to do that. So um, it's going to be in charge of some motor functions. And then we have something called the corpora quadrigemina, which um, translated means the bodies of four twins. And that's because it's really four bumps, like one, like two and then two that lie on top. Um, they are called the colliculi. So the, the inferior colliculi are the two bumps that are on the bottom and they are responsible uh, or play a role in some hearing reflexes while the superior colliculi are responsible for uh, vision reflexes. And I just remember which does which because the eyes are a little bit higher than the ears. So the superior colliculi are sitting on top of the inferior colliculi. And then the last part of our brainstem is the pons. This is the area that sits just below the midbrain. It's mostly fiber tracts, white matter, and it contains fibers that are involved in the control of breathing and sleep cycles, and then also some motor control as well. In fact, the pons is going to regulate um, a lot of the functions that the medulla oblongata does. And this is the lowest part of the brainstem, the medulla oblongata. Um, it's going to eventually merge with the spinal cord at its uh, distal end. Um, it has both white and uh, gray matter. So the white matter is going to be on the outside. Um, uh, um, um, I'm sorry, the white matter is going to be on the on, uh, the uh, inside of it. Excuse me, I thought I was talking about the spinal cord for a moment. Um, but the white matter is going to have projection tracks. And you might remember from an earlier slide that the projection tracks are going to cross over or decussate in the medulla oblongata, which means that some of the functions for the left side of the body are actually controlled by the right side of the brain and vice versa. Um, there are some nuclei, some clusters of gray matter that are found in the medulla oblongata that will regulate heart rate and blood pressure, breathing, swallowing, and vomiting. And then, of course, like I was talking about, the reticular formation is found within the brainstem as well. Um, again, it's, it's a diffuse collection of neurons that uh, are going to be under motor control of visceral organs. Uh, the RAS is a very special group of neurons that is going to play a role in consciousness in regulation of our sleep-wake cycle, and it's also going to act as a filter um, for what information actually gets into the cerebral cortex for us to respond to it. Okay, the last part of today's lecture is about the cerebellum, and uh, you can see that the cerebellum is kind of a cauliflower-looking like structure. It's going to be tucked underneath the cerebrum, and it's attached just behind the brainstem. And the cerebellum uh, is um, separated from the cerebrum by a fissure that's called the transverse fissure. And it also has two cerebral hemispheres, but it's not separated by the longitudinal fissure. It's separated by kind of a crack that's called the vermis. Um, it's mostly made up of neurons, so it's got a lot of gray matter that's found on the outside of the cerebellum. And if you look at a cross section of it, um, the white matter is arranged kind of like trees, so they call that the arbor vitae. So inside of the cerebellum, we have something that's called the dentate nuclei. It's found in each um, hemisphere of the cerebellum, and it's connected to motor areas of the brainstem, um, and it will influence the motor cortex. So what this means is that our movements, because our cerebellum is going to play a large role um, in our muscle memory, 
um, it's going to influence uh, our like sensory information will influence how we move. And um, I'm going to come back to the slide in just a minute, but I'm running out of time on this recording. So I'll be back in a flash.